Hello, and welcome to the second part of this GNU radio tutorial series. First, we're going to look at hysteresis using the threshold block. Hysteresis is a very handy technique for stabilizing the output of a control loop where its inputs are noisy. This can be achieved using the threshold block by setting independent values for the low and high levels. When the input signal is below the low level, it will output a zero and when it's above the high level, it will output a 1. We're going to simulate this noisy input by adding, using the add block, a constant value and the output from this noise source. Both of them can be altered at runtime using the variable sliders. We have the level ID and the noise ID. You can see here in the constant source, its value will take on that of the level slider and this one will take on the value of the noise slider. They are added, input into the threshold, which will output ones and zeros, and we're going to graph that using the scope sync. We also graph the original input noise after the add block, as well as that fixed constant level that we can change at runtime. The first two inputs on the scope sync are connected back to these other constant source blocks and these are simply the low and high levels that the threshold operates on. This is just so that we can frame the data graphically when we re represent it using the scope sync. We also have a histogram sync which is going to plot the distribution of the samples coming out from the noise block just to check that we do in fact get a Gaussian profile. One final note before I run the flow graph, I've set the grid position for both of these GUI elements so that they will sit side by side on the screen. I've also set the window size so that they fit within the dimensions of this screen. So let's run the flow graph. We see here on the right hand side we do have a Gaussian profile so that's working well. The frame size is quite large so we consider a number of samples when creating the plot and the number of bins is such that it just is drawn nicely on the screen. Let's look at the scope plot. We've got the high and low levels shown by the green and blue lines respectively. The red line here, channel 3, is the output of the threshold block so that will either be 0 or 1 and we have our noisy input channel 4 shown in purple. This is the addition of that constant level plus the noise. We can change these by dragging the sliders around. I can change the low level for instance and you can see the blue line moving around. Take that back to the original value. Let's emphasize these levels by changing the lines to dots so they're easier to distinguish. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start increasing the level and you can see channel 5 appearing around the center of that noise. That's the constant source and we're going to keep increasing it until eventually our output of the threshold will change. Now this is interesting because although that constant level didn't get anywhere near the high threshold, the output of the threshold block actually changed to 1. Why was this? Because with the added noise, it just exceeded at some point the high threshold. Now it would be handy to actually see this happening, if it in fact is happening like that. And you can do this easily by going into the trigger tab for the scope plot. You can see this new label has appeared with this orange line. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the trigger so that it will operate on channel number 4, our noisy source, and set the level just on that high threshold. And this is what you would do, say, for example, on a normal oscilloscope. So we're going to change the mode to normal, change the slope to negative, change the channel to 4, is our noisy source and as you can see everything stopped because the noisy source is just fluctuating around this narrow region and it's not getting it anywhere near this trigger line. We're going to start increasing this and as you can see it's activated again and we're going to have that sit just on the high threshold and as you can see only very rarely does the added noise cause the added value to exceed that high threshold but it does and so that confirms the behavior that we saw before when the output of the threshold block changed from 0 to 1. We can turn off the trigger just by going back to auto.
Now we can change the level here and just in a similar fashion even though we're not close to the low threshold the noise is just pushing it below and the binary output will change back to zero. So that is the simple demonstration of hysteresis and how you can configure this flow graph at runtime. One final note regarding this flow graph you can see there are, are a number of throttle blocks. You can place as many throttles in as you like, but I've found that depending on your flow graph, you can actually just get away with one. Let's consider what's going on here. The point is you want every single bit of data flow to be throttled, otherwise it's just going to max out your CPU and you're going to have mismatches in the rate at which data proceeds through the flow graph. The test that I found works is that as long as you can trace a block back to a throttle at some stage in the flow graph, you should be all right. Now we have a, an active throttle here. All of these other ones just connect straight through into the scope sync. And so the flows coming out of this throttle will obviously be throttled. And so this input to the scope sync will be. If we go through the add, that goes into the threshold, that should be as well. But these two ones as they go directly will also be throttled because the way the GNU radio uh, engine works is that it will pass in data all at once into a work function which is encapsulated inside a block. So when the next iteration of work happens it will take in all these samples at once and process them in one go which means that even if some of the inputs are not throttled then if at least one of the other ones are by the way in which the work function takes in data at once from all of the ports every one of them will end up being throttled and this is interesting to note here as well for the histogram sync this is directly connected to the noise source now if this noise source wasn't connected to anything else then this disconnected part of the graph would proceed as quickly as it possibly could and saturate the CPU but because the noise source actually connects as well into the add block what I was saying before about taking in a bunch of samples from all ports into the next iteration of work this is also happening with the add so if we look at the first port of the add that's connected into the throttle block so this will take in a number of samples in one go from both and calculate the added value and output that but because the second input is therefore throttled that means that the noise source through this path will be throttled and that will affect the way the noise source is producing samples it'll affect it so that it, it's thr throttled itself and therefore all other flows coming out of it including this one directly into the histogram sync will be throttled as well so I hope that made sense. The point is that if you're not entirely sure what's going on, just stick the thr throttles in, see how you go. You might see slight mismatches or lags in your uh, various data flows into your scope sync, or you might see saturation of your CPU or things running slower than they should be. And in that case, just have a very careful, considered analysis of how your data is flowing around and the rate at which it's doing so. Remember that here the sample rate for the scope sync actually only defines how the x-axis is drawn or, or rather the labels for the x-axis in time are calculated. The histogram sync itself does not contain sample rates so there's no notion of timing here it just takes in samples as they come through the graph. So that's the first one let's take a look at the second one. Here we're going to use the threshold block again but we're going to use it with a view to calculating bit error rates. Now, the source that we use here is a Galois linear feedback shift register of degree 6 that's going to produce a pseudo-random stream of relatively short period. We throttle that. The, we're dealing with bytes here, as you can see by the color coding. The source block will produce a byte stream, but only the first least significant bit of each byte will be valid. That is carry information. The rest of them, the rest of the bits, the remaining seven, won't carry any information. 
This is passed through into the reference input of the error rate block. And the error rate block will compare pairs of samples coming in through its input ports. And if they're incorrect, that will be a corrupted bit of data coming in. And it will know that it's corrupted because the reference is the stream against which it will compare. Let's have a look at the properties of the error rate block. You set the window size, which is the total number of samples over which it will calculate the error rate. And this is just simply the proportion of incorrect bits to the total number of bits. The type relates to the way in which it does this. If you set bit error rate, then you can specify the number of bits per byte that you want it to compare. Here we have one because we know that there's only one valid information bit in each byte. But you can also set it to symbol error rate, which means that it will do it on a byte for byte basis. This is equivalent to setting bit error rate and setting bits per symbol to 8, since there are 8 bits in a byte. Now, in terms of actually having error rate create interesting output, we want to corrupt the original source stream, and we can do that by using this XOR block. Consider the way in which the XOR function will work. We have the original stream coming in to the first input, and the second input will control whether or not those bits will be corrupted or flipped. And this will happen in a very easy manner. If a zero is present on the second input, then that means the bytes or bits coming through the first input will flow through unchanged into the input of the error rate block. If the value at the second port is one, that means that all bits coming through the input, the first input of the XOR block, will be flipped due to the XOR function. And therefore flipped bits will pass through and be seen as incorrect by the error rate block since it will be compared against the reference stream which will be different. How to actually flip these bits in a random fashion? Let's scroll down and have a look at the noise source here. We've set this to uniform distribution now with amplitude 1 so it's going to produce samples that are uniformly distributed between positive and negative 1. We throttle this as well and put this into the threshold block. Here we're using the same threshold values for low and high so this is actually going to operate as a binary, binary threshold and output a 0 if the level is less than our threshold and a 1 if it's greater than the threshold. We control this threshold at runtime using this slider. We're going to visualize the results of our various blocks using these graphical user interface elements. We've got a number sync which will print the number on the screen as well as show it on a gauge and graph it over time using the scope. In terms of the noise source for randomly flipping bits, we're going to plot the output of the threshold on the histogram sync to measure the distribution of ones and zeros which are going to be used to flip bits in the original source stream as well as using the scope sync to graph that thresholded random stream. The second input will graph the actual raw stream and the third will simply draw a line at the level of our threshold. Before I run it, just remember that you have to ensure that the types are compatible because down here we're dealing with real types, real floating point types and here we're dealing with bytes, you need to use the float to char because the threshold will produce ones and zeros in floating point format and it needs to be bytes for the XOR block so we use float to char to convert from the floating point representation of one and zero to the byte and because we said before that we're only using one bit per byte the value of one and zero fit nicely of course in the first least significant bit Let's run this now. We can see here the random source in green on the second channel. Our threshold is 0.9 shown by this red line and whenever the green line or the random values exceeds that threshold you can see a spike forming on the blue signal channel 1 which is the output of the threshold block so that's the binary output there that's used to flip the original bits
of the uh, linear feedback shift register source. Because we do have these spikes occurring, we are producing some ones, they are flipping some bits, and you can see that the error rate here on the number sync is non-zero, although still quite small, and you can see that presented graphically using this gauge here. If I start changing the threshold, if I bring it down, that means there are going to be more ones produced, you can see more spikes appearing on the scope, more ones means more flip bits, and so more of the original stream is corrupted and therefore the error rate is going up. If I take it all the way down to zero, we've effectively cut this in half, so there's equal chance of a zero or a one being produced after the threshold, and so you would expect approximately half of the bits to be corrupted, which is why our error rate is approximately 50%. Let's have a look at the distribution of those ones and zeros after the threshold block. You can see they're roughly equal. If I start bringing the threshold back up again, then our error rate is going down, the proportion of ones is decreasing, and if you look at the labels on the y-axis, that is increasing as more and more zeros are produced eventually until we should get 100% of them. Now the threshold is at one, so we're never getting any spikes, never producing any ones, so none of the data is corrupted. Finally, let's look at the error rate on the scope. This is plotting it over a substantial period of time. If I start bringing the value back down again, you will see the line start to increase and the error rate in the number sync also going up. If I just leave this at a value, you can see both of them are fluctuating, the error rate in the number sync as well as on the scope, and this is due to the inherent noisy random nature of that noise source. It means that although we're approximately, let's say we bring it back down to zero, approximately 50% of the bits are being flipped. It's, as I said, just approximate, so that random nature is introducing uh, some uncertainty into exactly how many will be in each window of the analysis that the error rate block is doing. Remember this is a moving window so it's outputting the error rate at the same rate at which samples are actually coming into the error rate block. Now there are a couple of other blocks here that have been disabled. These are just uh, some previous experiments, some things you can bear in mind when you create your own flow graphs. Not particularly useful here, but a very useful block in other situations, the selector block. This can be used to reroute signal flows at runtime. So here we actually have two inputs and we can select between them and produce one output. You set the input index, so that would be either 0 or 1. Here I have the original stream coming in. On the second input I've got the original stream which passes through the NOT block, so it's going to invert the bits and then I can select between them. The reason why this is not suitable here is because whenever you change the index it will actually lock the flow graph in the GNU Radio runtime, change the flow graph internally and then unlock it and proceed with uh, the running of the flow graph. And this has a bit of a performance impact. Using the XOR block is much better in this scenario because we're just doing it on a bit for bit or byte for byte basis. In other situations where you need to selectively control the flow of data uh, through different ports and through different connections, you can reroute them using the selector block and that's quite handy. Thanks for watching and see you in part three.